60 Minutes advises that some scenes in the following program may disturb some viewers. Tonight, a special edition of 60 Minutes. It's just on a year since Osama bin Laden struck at the symbols of American power and prestige, the World Trade Centre and the Pentagon. That day, the mightiest nation on earth discovered how vulnerable it is. 60 Minutes was one of the first crews allowed into New York after the devastating attacks. Tonight, we revisit the city, a city fighting back. Some truly heroic stories, including an extraordinary escape, a miracle escape. The man trapped in Tower One who survived the 110 floor collapse. We've uncovered footage never before seen. And Prime Minister John Howard talks frankly about the next phase of the war on terror, invasion of Iraq. We begin with the events of that fateful day. For Derek and Orsham Parks, September 11 was shaping up to be one of the happiest days of their lives. At 10 to 7 in the morning, in a midtown Manhattan hospital, Orsham gave birth to their first child, Madison. I was getting bigger, I was tired. You know, with September, it was still hot. It was very hot last summer. At about 3.30 that morning, she kicked me and my water broke. But it wasn't bad. You know, I went in three pushes and she, she was out. Shortly after her birth, four passenger jets depart from three East Coast airports. Each plane was about to be hijacked. We came out of the recovery room and they, we were going to our room and they told us that the plane hit the first time we were like, ah, nah, this is not happening, not, not today. You know, and now I'm at that like, not nah, please, Lord, not today. At 8.47 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11, with 92 people on board, slams into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Oh, shit. Oh, oh. Floors 90 through to 100 are completely ravaged. In the streets below, people stare in disbelief as tons of debris rain down on one of the world's major financial districts. We have something that has happened here at the World Trade Center. We noticed flame and an awful lot of smoke from one of the towers of the World Trade Center. My heavens, this is just, just happened to be entirely in tower number one. Inside the tower, office workers head for the stairwells. For the ones who get out alive, it will take over an hour to reach the street. The carnage at the World Trade Center was becoming one of the most photographed single events in history as New Yorkers grabbed cameras and began to film. Oh my God, it was a huge explosion. Hey Dad, it's Kim. I just wanted to let you know that I'm fine. So please do not worry. I think it just happened. They bombed the World Trade Center. I'm looking at it, Meek Young's videotaping it. And as we're getting closer and closer and closer to the town, we're realizing it's more and more serious. With television cameras now beaming pictures live, United Flight 175, with 65 people on board, comes ominously into view. Oh. Oh. On our way up to the room, and the next plane hits. So I'm like, wait a minute, twice? It was now clear these events were not an accident. Black smoke coming from both of the towers. Thousands of kilometers away in a Florida primary school, President Bush, talking to second graders, is told of the second hit. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. But this was just the beginning. Some workers on the upper floors decide to take fate into their own hands. With the fear of being burnt alive, they jump to certain death. Over there, they're jumping out the windows, I guess, because they're trying to see themselves. Sean, it's me. I just want to let you know I love you. And I'm stuck in this building in New York. Now, less than an hour after the first plane hit the North Tower, another of the four hijacked jets finds its target. This time, it's the Pentagon. 
a little over a thousand kilometres away in Washington, D.C. It was a real severe intention is what it had to it. You could tell it was like a suicide bomber. The nerve centre of the U.S. military is badly damaged. Just nine minutes later in New York, the corner of the 80th floor in the South Tower starts to collapse. A band of exterior columns buckles and in a cloud of smoke and debris, the whole building begins to topple. It had taken only 56 minutes to fell this 110-storey skyscraper. Oh, shit. The, the tower of The collapsed. The top floor has collapsed down. Minutes later, the last of the hijacked jets, United Airlines Flight 93, crashes in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It was headed towards the nation's capital, but this time the hijackers are foiled by heroic passengers who storm the cockpit. Meanwhile, back on the streets of downtown New York, there was mayhem and destruction. At 10.28 a.m., Less than two hours after it was hit, the North Tower drops. Despite the thousands killed in those harrowing two hours, 20,000 were lucky enough to make it out alive. Amid the horror, there were also stories of courage and survival. But surely no escape is as miraculous as the one you're about to hear. Pasquale Buzelli was trapped high up in Tower 1 when the building collapsed. 80 floors fell on top of him and he survived. From New York, here's Tara Brown. I arrived in New York just a few days after the terrible attack. This normally lively, cocky city was at a standstill. You could actually feel the pain, the grief, the confusion. The impact of loss of life and loss of invincibility was palpable. When I returned here six months later, much of the rubble had been removed, yet rescue workers were still searching. Even the smell of dust and burning still hung over the city. Now, as the anniversary looms, New York and its people seem determined to move on. The World Trade Centre has become a construction site. The city is almost as busy and brash as it always has been. Yet, at its heart, there remains this huge hole, an aching reminder of an unprecedented attack and more than 3,000 people who lost their lives. In suburban New Jersey lives one man who should never have made it home on September 11. Pasquale Bazzelli's story of survival has to be one of the most remarkable you'll ever hear because without exaggeration, this man should be dead. He was high up in Tower 1 when it came crashing down. 33-year-old Pasquale was in the elevator on his way to his office on the 64th floor when the first plane hit. The elevator plunged, caught itself before continuing skywards to his floor. He and his workmates knew something was wrong, but he had to call his pregnant wife Louise to find out there was a plane burning 30 floors above him. When I put the TV on, I saw his building, the top of his building on fire. And I couldn't believe that I was actually talking to him on the phone. And they were saying that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. So I told him, Pasquale, a plane hit the World Trade Center. Please just get off the phone with me. Just get out of there. We are just currently getting a look at the World Trade Center. We have I never thought it was a commercial airline. I thought it might have been a small plane or something that hit the building. So I didn't feel that impact. In all, there were 16 of them left on the 64th floor. Pasquale says their boss, the New York Port Authority, told them to stay where they were until advised otherwise. They waited over an hour for the call to get out. It never came. And then the smoke started coming in, and then we all just 
gathered in single file, uh, we, and we counted. You know, we counted 16 people. Uh, and I remember, you know, looking back. And then, um, then we started making our way down the stairs. Well, as an engineer, did you ever <coughs> contemplate that building falling down? No. No. I mean, I'm a structural engineer and I couldn't see... It, it's a steel structure. Pasquale was now between the 23rd and 22nd floors with his workmates spread out behind him. The steel he had so much faith in gave way. I heard this tremendous pounding from above. Uh, I felt the building vibrate and it's just a constant pounding. So it almost, it sounded like something heavy was falling through the staircase, you know, tumbling through. Uh, and just, just instant reaction. Um, I just, I, I dove, I was about halfway down the stairs and I dove into the corner of the, of the next landing and I just curled up and just prayed. What did uh, you pray for? I, I prayed for my unborn daughter and I, I prayed to die quickly, you know. Once I knew the building was going, not, but it was, it was just a split second. Everything happened so quick. Why didn't you pray for life? Why didn't you say, dear God, please save me? When the walls cracked on top of me and I knew the building was going, the entire building, I mean, I felt myself falling, uh, you know. I was tumbling through it. I, my head, I was being knocked around. I felt like a sandblaster type of effect, uh, you know, as if somebody was hitting me with a sandblaster. I knew I was falling with the building. The building was crumbling. So uh, I never thought I'd make it out of there. I actually said it to myself, you know, in that split second, I can't believe that this is how I'm gonna die. You know, this is it. Was it fast? Was it in slow motion? It felt like, uh, it felt like, I mean, it's, it's, it's weird to say, but it felt like a great adventure ride, just, uh, that feeling of falling, you know, just uh, that's in like a free fall. But at the same time, I just, I tried to stay as tucked in as possible. Um, and I just kept getting knocked around. Uh, and I, I saw flashes of light. I saw about five flashes of light. And what were they from? Impacts to my head. When you were falling, were you saying anything? Were you screaming? No. No. Just praying and praying uh, my wife would be taken care of and quick death. Do you remember landing? No, there was one final, I remember seeing one large flash, one final thing. That's the last thing I remember. It took eight seconds for 110 floors to fall. Pasquale landed on this slab of concrete, not much bigger than himself, which had landed on debris stacked two stories high. He was out cold for three hours. Actually, when I, when I sat up, I thought I was dead because I was just numb. I didn't feel anything. It was, uh, it sounds silly to say, but I felt like an angel was gonna come by and, you know, take me away or something like that because I, I didn't feel anything at that point. Louise saw the horror unfold on television. All I kept saying was no, no, no. And I remember I just couldn't even watch it anymore. I couldn't. You know, I couldn't see it anymore. Did any part of you believe that he could have survived that? No. Not only did Pasquale survive, but incredibly, he was largely unscathed, a broken right foot and some cuts and bruises. But he was trapped on his precarious perch for another hour. All he could do was marvel at his luck. So what's even more mind-boggling to me is that it's, it's in addition to the fall itself, the 18 floors, I had 80 plus floors, and you've seen it on the television, fall directly on top of me. It came straight down. Oh my God! I mean, I thought, I thought we were at war. I mean, we are at war, but I thought in the sense that all of Manhattan was destroyed. Every five minutes or so, I'd yell out for help. I'd yell out, you know, names of people that were with me or just to look around and stuff and uh, just heard no, I didn't hear any voices or anything, but I did hear a lot of explosions. Um, fires were erupting uh, around me and stuff. Uh, I mean, I guess I, I shouldn't be ashamed of it, but I actually, I looked around for a piece of metal. She just slipped my wrists because I, I wanted some sense of control. 
you know, I wanted to take that into my own hands, you know, and I think God would have understood. I didn't want to burn alive. Um, so I felt if the fire got close enough, I would do it myself. When he was finally discovered, 20 firemen lined up to winch Pasquale off his ledge and pass him from one to the other across a field of rubble into an ambulance, some four hours after his building collapsed. My wife was at home pretty much the whole day thinking I was dead. And I said, they have a phone. I said, I need to call my wife. And I answered it, and it was him. And I mean, you know, like just to hear your voice that day, it just, uh, you know, it was like, it was like um, hearing like an angel's voice. Eh? A month and a half after Pasquale's unbelievable escape, Louise gave birth to their first child, a daughter they named Hope. A new life, a new reason for living. I don't take anything for granted. I try not to. I just want to be here for my daughter. That's the biggest thing. So I focus on her a lot. This month, Louise will release this song to raise money for women who lost their partners in the World Trade Centre, a tragic club she joined for a short time. Her charity is called Song for Hope Foundation. Would I see you again? You know, and I only lived what they lived for one day. I don't know how they go on up until today. Sunshine in her smile. How many miracles do you think saved you that day? How many miracles? Three, maybe? The elevator, which I should have died there. Probably, I mean, a lot of people died in the elevators. Uh, the building collapse, and my daughter. So, three. Yeah. Have you bought a lottery ticket? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think I won the biggest lottery. <laughs> you did win the biggest yeah. lottery. Yeah. Yeah. There was perhaps never any doubt that New Yorkers would fight back. Their legendary enthusiasm, determination and grit have brought their city back to life. On the streets, it's business as usual. But in their hearts, well, that's another matter. Walk the streets of New York today, and it's once again that exhilarating city that has seduced so many. The buzz is back. But stay a while, and there's also an undercurrent of sorrow that comes into sharp focus when you see the 16-acre expanse that was once the World Trade Center. The rescuers have gone, the cleanup is winding down but there's still reverence for this sad place. People come to look, to wonder. Others for whom this will always be a tragic graveyard, stay away. How many of your friends did you lose? Well, there was 12 of us that went up. Two of us made it out, me and my friend Joe. Everybody that went up in the elevator, it's gone. Louis Caccioli has been a New York fireman for 20 years. Trained to save the lives of strangers, nothing could prepare him for the loss of so many friends. I must have gone to about 70 memorials, maybe more. That's a lot of people to say goodbye to, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's terrible. I know my life will never be the same, but one thing I learned is that uh, I'll never complain because uh, there's a lot of people worse than I am. Louis is lucky to be here. After rescuing a group of office workers from Tower One, this brave man was heading back into the building to find his men when the skyscraper started to fall. The last one I heard, look out, look out. The tower that I was in was coming down. I'm running, I threw my mask, and next day I look back, I remember seeing the antenna of the building it was going down. And I see the big black ball. So now I look back again, 
and I'm running. It's right behind me, and I know, and I'm getting hit in the head with all kind of debris. So what I did, I threw myself on the floor. So all of a sudden, the smoke got me, and I couldn't see my hand in front of my face because it was like sawdust. I'm crawling, and I felt a, 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 a tire from a fire truck. I said, oh my God, this is a fire truck. I went another maybe 10 feet, and I found the mask on the floor, like the, my mask. Somebody must have did the same thing I did. And I just put it like this, and I was dragging it. And I was just going, and then I collapsed. Louis came too as he was being dragged to safety. Refusing to go to hospital, he worked until late that night and then for days afterwards trying to find his missing mates. I never gave up hope. I still can't believe today that we couldn't find one live person down there searching. We couldn't find one. We couldn't find a soul. All we found was body parts. In our minds, we were going to rescue them all. These guys are all survivors. This is what we do for a living. Somehow New York cop a, Bill Fisher lost 13 friends that day. Somehow there's, a, there's, a, there's an air pocket and they have water and it's just a matter of time. They're all just waiting for us, you know? And after the second week and uh, the third week, nobody said anything, but it started to sink in that um, you know, they're all gone, really gone. Bill's search at Ground Zero went on for four futile months. The torment still goes on. A lot of guys are uh, going for counselling. And normally uh, in the police department, uh, that was like a real uh, no, no, you because you wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't be mentally right. You and what about you? For me, oh yeah, I've I've been to uh, yeah, I've talked to people. Um, and what about the impact on your family, for instance? It took its toll. Um, it's a real strain on the marriage. How does a, a person who hasn't went through that deal with somebody who did? You know. Um, No, it's rough. A year on, the grief is compounded by a sense of powerlessness. In your job, you so often get the man, don't you? So, yeah. so what does it feel like not to get the perpetrators of this attack? Very frustrating. There's no address that we can go to. You know, there's no information where this person is and let's go. It was, um, gather up your dead. They'll start construction, and it's that's pretty messed up. I, I'm still bitter. I'm angry that uh, what was done to us. Okay, I'm bitter. I'm I'm mad. I'm mad. You know, I don't want to point fingers and everything else, but somebody's not doing their job, and we lost a lot of lives here. Louis also lost his job that day. He's had to retire sick. The suffocating smoke that nearly took his life ruined his sight and damaged his lungs. He's kept his uniform from September 11, a uniform he'll never wear again. It's just that way. I, I try not to go near it because it brings back a lot of memories. And. Uh, I said I haven't touched it in you know, quite a long time. It's months I haven't touched this. I try not to. Why do you keep it if it's so painful? I just keep it because this is my life. I can't do it anymore. And I just got to go on. I can never get rid of this. This is all part of me. The World Trade Center will always be a painful part of New York. Twelve months on, photos of the missing are starting to fade, and hawkers have come up with their own ghoulish mementos. But there's always a chilling reminder of the devastation. Just last month, 
body parts were found on the rooftop of a nearby building. I'm now standing on what's left of the World Trade Center. Now, it's not Manhattan, but a landfill site on Staten Island where the ruins of September 11 were shipped, sorted, and now buried. All that remains of those imposing twin towers is this mangled metal. The rest has either been melted down or reduced to something about this size, just a few centimetres. 1.4 million tonnes of debris was taken from ground zero, brought up here and searched. 1.4 was reduced down to a quarter of an inch before it was landfilled. Dennis Diggins oversaw what became the biggest cleanup operation ever for New York. 108,000 truckloads of debris collected from the World Trade Center and taken to this landfill dump on Staten Island. Over 55,000 pieces of personal effects were recovered. Uh, they recovered over 4,200 remnants of human remains. And of that, 209 people to date have been identified. So it did give some closure to some, to some victims' families. It was the biggest crime scene in history. Authorities sifted through every bit of it, pulverised concrete, twisted steel, anything that might lead them to the elusive black box or the identity of some poor soul. Do you ever comprehend in those early days the emotional enormity of, of what you guys were doing here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, every time you saw one of the search crews walking across the field carrying a pail, you knew that he was carrying human remains, and it was, uh, it, it always brought it back, you know, what we were dealing with. The burial of rubble has only just finished. These are the only remaining steel girders from the towers. They're to go to museums around the country to join other artefacts that have been salvaged like one of only two telephones found in the debris. A teaspoon, an elevator tag from the 102nd floor, and small, unidentifiable bits of plane. Is this a special place? To me, it is now. You're gonna look at this place with renewed respect for what it, you know, what it carries. Because now it carries the World Trade Center. Well, it carries the World Trade Center, sure. In a way, rebuilding the World Trade Center is the easy part. Repairing the human spirit is much harder. For those closest to the tragedy, this first anniversary remembers fallen friends and celebrates heroes. But healing still seems a long way off. It's not over. It's not over. I hope to God it is over, but it's not over and the damage is done. We lost too much. You know, you would think after something like this, you feel like you're invincible, but you actually don't. You feel like you could die at any time. I don't want to feel that because I was never afraid of anything before, and I don't want to be afraid of anything now, so I'm fighting that. For me, it's not a defined emotion. It's just like a weird, like butterflies in your stomach almost. You know, I wish I could like just like sleep through September 11th to wake up on the 12th and not even think about it. But for one family in New York, September 11 will be a day of celebration. Madison Parks was born just before the planes hit. For Derek and Orsham, their daughter's first birthday is a time to think about the future she represents. What will you tell your daughter about September 11? That it was the happiest day of our life, because it's her birthday. That was the day that God chose for her to come into the world. I mean, we're just gonna teach her that along with life comes death, and that, you know, her birthday is just a special day and it just happens to share a day with something tragic that happened. But we'll just teach her that first and foremost, it's her birthday and 
It's the happiest day of our life. The United States has shown a steely determination to prosecute the war on terror. In Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda's training camps have been destroyed, its fighters decimated. The whereabouts of Osama bin Laden remain uncertain. In a moment, Charles Woolley interviews the Prime Minister about Australia's commitments to this war on terror, including the prospects of war against Iraq. But first, John Miller in Afghanistan. After nearly six months in country, the 101st Airborne is on their final mission. We're fighting a war here. We're here to accomplish a mission. The battalion commander is Lieutenant Colonel Patrick Fetterman. The enemy is Al-Qaeda, yes, but anyone who shoots at us becomes the enemy. They are on a search and attack operation. Do you have any word from the scouts yet? looking for pockets of Al-Qaeda fighters near the Pakistani border. It's only about 600 meters from here. We think this is probably a key route that they're using to smuggle guns in and out of. But then in the village, they hit pay dirt. They find documents and a huge stash of Al-Qaeda weapons. It had about 400 rounds of 82 millimeter mortar ammunition, 22 cases of Vanna personnel mines, recoilless rifle ammunition, small arms ammunition, hand grenades, and other various things that you, know, you don't need unless you're gonna try to make war. Even as we were at Bagram Air Base, we watched as wounded soldiers returned from the battlefield. American casualties have so far been low. Al-Qaeda is still out there and fighting. But what about their leader? Osama bin Laden is one of the most widely recognized faces on the planet at this point. Yet, after all these months, there is still no positive sign one way or another as to whether he is dead or perhaps still on the loose in those mountains behind me. Where is Osama bin Laden is indeed the question of the day. And the truth is, if I knew the answer to that, he would be sharing in this interview with you and I because I would ensure that he was here. Lieutenant General Dan McNeil commands the Allied forces in this region. I operate on the premise that Al-Qaeda or the enemy forces continue to have leadership and continue to have some ability because they have leadership. McNeil runs the battle from this command center under a giant tent at Bagram Air Base. We have a group in here that works all of our automation, our computers. The intelligence computers information on the enemy people. and updates from any battle in the field come across these laptop computers in real time. We have established a relatively good tactical and operational set here and they know that we're either going to capture or kill them and so my guess is they will not miss opportunities to take us on. But if bin Laden is in Afghanistan, until that country has a real army of its own, the American forces can't leave. There are still numerous Al-Qaeda representatives in this country. There's a lot of work to be done here still. Prime Minister, how is it that we don't know yet whether Osama is dead or alive, given the billions that have probably been spent on intelligence? Well, it's just the nature of uh, the elusive life of, of, of terrorist leaders. He might be dead. I, I don't know. There's no clear evidence that he is. Uh, certainly his network in uh, Afghanistan has been uh, crippled. Uh, that's not to say that his network in other parts of the world, if he is still alive, isn't still a threat. We can take it that he's not irreplaceable, though. Oh, no. And that's the problem. Um, when you're dealing with uh, blind terrorism, which we are, we saw it on the 11th of September, there are always fanatics to take the place of the uh, recently departed fanatic. <laughs> 